Twin Cities Habitat has put together. Um, and then we have some legislative agenda items that are on the menu, and I'd love feedback from any of you, perspective from where you are on the legislative agenda. Um, as uh, April mentioned, I'm pretty new here, and so I really would love feedback or questions. Don't be shy. I want to make sure that I'm saying things the right way, so jump in whenever. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on the impact of advocacy in Minnesota. And so I guess I'd like to start by asking, how many homes does Habitat build and renovate throughout Minnesota every year? Does anybody have a guess on that? You can raise your hand or type in a response. Well, all right, Britta guesses April 50. 50. 50. That's a good guess. Parker so, says um, 120. Any other guesses? Get or educated guesses. 50, 120. That might be it. Okay. So, um, actually, those are good guesses. But habitats impact through building and renovating homes throughout Minnesota um, is actually over 300. And the over 300 homes that volunteers work on each year has a huge impact on families in the entire community. It's a really exciting number. However, the size of the problem is huge, and it's growing really quickly. So let's look at the size of the problem. It's this much larger circle here. And we can talk about the over 10,000 homeless people that are on the streets on every given night throughout Minnesota, um, the one in seven households that now pay more than half of their income for housing, um, the homeless rates that have tripled and the high rate of homelessness amongst our youth. Um, and so looking at the size of the problem, we know that the problem is bigger than Habitat can solve alone. So to achieve our mission, we need to get more people talking about housing and spreading the word about creative solutions. Um, the goal is to have a greater impact in renovating, building, and advocating for affordable homes. So let's kind of look at what's um, been going on at the state level. And some of you guys may be well aware of this. If so, I, I apologize for being repetitive, but I want to just make sure to cover it. Um, and in about 2011, it became very clear that housing organizations were oftentimes being pitted against each other at the legislature. There were service organized service providers sometimes fighting with developers when at the end of the day we all have the same goal of making sure that people have safe and quality housing um, and with the push of Alice Hausman um, at the house it became very clear that we needed to join forces and work together so the homes for all coalition was created um, and in 2012 was the first year that Homes for All worked together at the legislative session. Twin Cities Habitat has um, had the capacity to play a big role within Homes for All. And, um, and that, that's been just a very positive experience that we're continuing. Um, and I'll talk more about the legislative agenda for Homes for All as this presentation moves forward. So in 2012, that first year, it was a bonding year, and more than 35 million went to affordable housing. This was just a massive number compared to what had been happening beforehand because they worked together. That year, the total bonding bill was for, it was almost 500 million, so the 35 million was just a, a really great um, win for us. And in 2013, the legislative session was also good. So this was um, um, not a bonding year, although bonding did come up. It was a budget year. And Minnesota Housing received $34 million, and that was a 24% increase from the year before. And the Department of Human Services uh, received $7 million, which is 42% increase from the year before. And the real question for me is always like, well, what does this mean? How is this helping families and getting people off the streets and into affordable, safe housing? So here we have some of the impact from the 2013 legislative session. You see thousands and thousands of families were helped, whether from home buying counseling, preventing foreclosure, actually developing houses, preventing homelessness, and providing services to help those who are experiencing homelessness get off the streets. 
So you can see when we go back to the original graph that I showed you earlier that the hap the um, the impact that was felt by through by being involved with Homes for All was much much greater than the great work that we're doing simply um, by building and renovating homes alone. So I want to just talk uh, briefly about the continuum of housing. Um, um, Homes for All believes, and the reason why we've been so successful is in working towards the continuum of housing choices. Some people need emergency services and shelter tonight. Other people are on their way to home ownership and they need some assistance with that, whether that's habitat or market rate. Um, and then there's a lot of people that fall in between there. And so it's believed that by working, for instance, to end homelessness, we are at the end of the day working towards greater home ownership and vice versa. So did you think just habitat fall in a couple categories here? Is it supportive and home ownership or just home ownership? Habitat falls strictly under home ownership. Supportive housing is is um, housing for that has a lot of more wraparound type services. Maybe it's kind of like your um, I think some affiliates anyone. might think they're providing supportive housing. But you know, I think that that's <laughs> that's true. There's a lot of that that goes on. Right. I think uh, um, technically that, we are on the true. home ownership <laughs> at the end of the continuum. Okay, like that's the yes, ultimate yes. goal. Got it. Yes, yeah, supportive housing is uh, technically usually um, rental. And, and I, I agree that we do a lot of wraparound services around home ownership. Um, um, but yes, that would fall under that. And you're going to see throughout this presentation that we are working on more than just home ownership. Um, we want to make sure there's a variety of options. And at least for Twin Cities Habitat, when we were looking at this, it really fit in our mission of helping everyone, not just um, people who could afford homes. So I wanted to include this slide because it shows the need for more affordable housing. The income is such that people simply cannot afford um, afford housing at market rate, and we know that that's getting tighter. So let's look at some smart investments in housing that could potentially be used by some funding. Um, so we put some interactive slides on here for you guys. Um, for a family of three experiencing homelessness, which of these solutions costs taxpayers less money? One month in a shelter or one month in apartments? And you can type in your responses. Tristan says B. And that is correct. Um, one month in apartment does cost significantly less. A two bedroom apartment at fair market rent costs $924 and a shelter stay costs $2,697. And this is, uh, this is more in the uh, Twin Cities area and I'm interested to know how much other people feel like they pay or is the um, fair market rent in their county or in their city. I know we've been looking at, um, or most recently, I was really looking at southwestern Minnesota because the, there's such a lack of housing there that the rental costs were going up. And having being someone who had an apartment in Worthington <laughs> back in the 90s, I would just I can't remember the exact number, but I couldn't believe how expensive it was. I mean, it seemed like it was double what I had. I mean, when I was living there, I had a two bedroom apartment. Why? I don't know. But um, I want to say it was like four less than $500 and that it was at least double that even, even in a small town. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what we see throughout Minnesota is that um, affordable housing is needed in every County throughout Minnesota. Um, this this chart shows the weekly work hours needed in order to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment at the minimum wage. And while it is a bit more intense in the cities, it's clear that this is not this is this is a Minnesota issue. So the next one I have in smart investment in housing is if a family of four makes thirty-five thousand a year, what is the most that they should be paying for housing? And the options are ten thousand five hundred, sixteen thousand five hundred, or twenty-one thousand five hundred. Does anyone have a guess for that? 
And I'm just seeing a note here that rent up around Virginia has been averaging around five to nine hundred for a two bedroom apartment. Wow. It's a lot of ranges here. The answer for this one is ten thousand five hundred, and this ten thousand five hundred includes basic utilities. Um, Good job, Britta and Parker. They got the answer correct. Nice. Um, and this, just to let you know, equals eight hundred and seventy-five dollars per month um, for rent and utilities. As an interesting side note, to make thirty-five thousand per year, two people would have to work full time, earning about eight fifty per hour or more than minimum wage. If it's one person working, they would have to earn almost seventeen dollars per hour to make thirty-five thousand a year. So what percentage of families who earn less than 35000 a year are paying more than they can afford for housing? Is it 40%, 51%, or 76%? Got one guess for C. I hate calling it a guess. I mean, I might just know. Oh, another one for B. Another person responds 76%. Uh, the um, answer is 76% of families are paying, who earn less than 35000 a year, are paying more than they can afford for housing. And let's look at the comparison there. 22% uh, of families earning over 35000 pay more than they can afford for housing. So you can really see that 35000 mark right there has a huge impact. Um, With the and we can look at, for those of you who are on this, on the webinar, for those of you who, with the, somebody making less than $35,000 potentially qualify for a Habitat home with your criteria? It kind of depends on the AMI in your area, but if they were a little under 35000 is it feasible that they would qualify for a home in your area? You can type in responses or raise your hand, but keep you can keep going, Rebecca. I was just curious. Yeah, and for us, it would depend on the size of the family. Okay, and Parker um, says yes. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Britta says we have as low as twenty thousand dollars to qualify. Okay, good. Yeah, awesome. I mean sometimes that depends on what the what the range is in your service area. So I was just curious. Yeah, and just to kind of highlight this, we have this um, chart uh, that shows the cost of housing that has outpaced median earnings by two to one since two thousand five. So you can really see um, kind of the trouble that families are facing more and more every single year. The green line is rental housing. The um, pink line is the owner occupied. So I just want to pause real here, real quick here, to say that these last few slides that have had the multiple choice answers. Oh, actually, mm -hmm. I have one more. And then I'll uh, one more here is the average cost for mortgage foreclosure prevention is four hundred dollars. What is the average cost to the community to recover from one foreclosure? Six thousand, thirty-six thousand, or sixty thousand? One one response for C. Oh, several for C. Nice. Oh, one so, for B. Yeah. Okay, yeah. here we go. Yep. The answer is sixty thousand. That's the average cost to a community, um, and that's a decreased property values to the community, increased city maintenance like police, lawn care, trash pickup, snow removal. Um, the lenders themselves lose an average of forty to fifty thousand dollars per house, which affects the business community and economy as a whole. And I think the thing that is always the most surprising to me about this number is that it doesn't include the loss that the homeowners experience, um, which we know is, is huge to them. Um, and so it's more than sixty thousand. Um, and this is where I just want to pause real quick to mention that all of these these kind of multiple choice questions and stuff is being pulled from the Build Think Act um, that my colleague Jill um, does. And I think, April, is she doing a training on that? Yep, up? I'm going to post it for everybody. Um, everybody had the opportunity to to be a part of this, but um, this we are hosting a Train the Trainer workshop with Jill. Uh, at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity on Friday, November 15th. Um, I think, let's see, who's on our call today? A couple of you who are on the webinar today are already planning to attend. But if you do this webinar and you think you're available on the 15th and would like to participate, just contact me and we can, we can talk about the possibilities.
these come specifically from the return on investment game that are, is played with volunteers. It's a, it's probably one of the most popular games and it has the greatest impact. Um, so I'm just going to put a plug in for that briefly. Um, let's go ahead and move on to advocacy though, because uh, that's what we're ultimately here to be talking about today. And Homes for All has a draft legislative agenda. There are three parts to it, but we'll start with this one. Um, there is a policy team committee that I'm part of, and the recommendation that went to the entire Homes for All is to advocate for $100 million in bonds for affordable housing to be included in the 2014 bonding bill. And we'll talk more about that, but that's the uh, agenda item. Um, that, that specifically looks at $80 million in housing infrastructure bonds for supportive housing construction and $20 million in general obligation bonds for federally subsidized housing preservation. So we'll come back to this, but I wanted to get this uh, agenda item out there. But let's go ahead and start real quick by looking at what does bonding mean. Um, and I guess I'll say that one day I really hope that this is me paying off my student loans. And just like I took out a loan to pay for college, the state sometimes needs to take out a loan to pay for major projects, like upgrades to wa uh, wastewater treatment plants, new facilities at universities, museums, flood mitigation, bridges, and yes, affordable housing. There's um, really good debt and there's really bad debt. Um, being able to build the 35W bridge is, I think, something that is a long-term um, a long-term funding for infrastructure. And the goal is to make sure that we are building things that can have a great impact with this money. So I'm going to give you, that's just the very basics, but let me give you some advanced information. You actually don't need to know this to be able to talk to any legislator or to talk to any volunteers, but some people like to have more information. So instead of turning to a bank, the state raises funds by issuing a bond. And when investors buy a bond, they are lending money to the state and they receive interest um, as the loan is repaid. The bond works just like the stock market, but is at least eight times as large. So you maybe have heard of stocks and bonds. And the reason to get a bond instead of a traditional bank loan is because it's much more flexible and the interest rates are incredibly cheap. And so that is why bonding. Um, I think it might be interesting to note that Every year for like a decade has been a bonding year at the Capitol. Traditionally, only even years are supposed to be, but it just doesn't ever work out that way. Every year is a bonding year. Does anyone have any questions about bonding? Because you do not need to know this, but you do need to know this. In 2014, Homes for All is asking for $100 million in bonding to support affordable homes. And that sounds like a big scary number to a lot of people, so I want to just address that real quickly. Um, in 2012, the bonding, the bonding bill was about $500 million. This year, we're expecting it to be a billion dollars. Um, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. It's still being put together and we haven't heard yet from the governor on uh, what it'll officially be. That'll come out in late November, early December, or what his is, and then we'll see what the legislators is. But we're expecting a billion dollars. So 100 million is 10% of that. And let's look at what that actually means. Um, Homes for All put together a pipeline study asking as many developers as possible, how many affordable units they have ready to be built today. There are over 8,000 affordable units, nearly 800 of them for homeless um, families that are ready to be built in Minnesota today. And so, hold on, I want to make sure I'm on the right page here. And so, what I think is surprising, and I meant to make some changes to this slide, so I apologize, is that the sum of the total development cost to build all these units today is $1.4 billion, billion dollars. So the $100 million ask that we're, we're looking at, it only gets us part way, to, to say the least. Um, the need is so much greater. I do want to talk briefly about uh, the fact that Habitat doesn't actually get any direct impact from bonding itself. Um, as we discussed earlier though, it supports the continuum of housing, it supports the coalition, the um, Homes for All coalition, and it supports the entire campaign because we don't just look at everything as a one-year thing. We look at what about next year, and next year's a budget year, 
And in fact, this year might be a budget year even, but next year is definitely a budget year. And Habitat does get um, um, some funding from some of the budget year. And so what do we need to do to build the conversation around affordable homes um, and housing affordability um, today that supports us for next year when Habitat does um, receive some support? So I just wanted to address that quickly. So my question to start out with is how are any of your affiliates at this point um, thinking about engaging in advocacy for 2014? Um, does anyone have any plans um, at this point? Again, just if you'd like to be unmuted, either type that in or raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can share what you're working on related to advocacy. Mm -hmm. And also maybe you've done something in the past that um, may or may not be used mm -hmm. this year. Maybe um, having a legislator come and visit a site or work on site or maybe you went to the Capitol, uh, maybe you sent postcards or anything. Let me know what you have or will be working on. Brian, are you available to share if I unmute you? I'm going to unmute you and just check. There, I unmute you. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Hi. Hi, Brian. Well, I went to the Habitat Immersion Retreat in February. Yeah. And since then, we have, and when I came back, Kevin had recently been to International. And when they came back, he came back with their outline for the new goals and objectives through 2018, which I don't believe anywhere on there did it say build more houses. Mm -hmm. But I did talk about getting involved in the community more at, and in advocacy. And we've done that. We formed a group. We call it Hammer with a Heart. We're going to be doing the training. Mm -hmm. And we've met a few times. We had a housing summit last week in Rochester uh, that I'm not sure who put it on, but it was a collection of government and private organizations and nonprofits that were coming together to talk about housing issues in Rochester and Olmstead County, um, particularly looking at the fact that with uh, Mayo's Destination Medical Center concept that they've come up with where they want to spend about I don't know, over five billion in the community um, toward making this a place to come for medical purposes even more than they already do. Um, and they went to the state to get money for infrastructure upgrades because they think mm -hmm. they'll need it, which the state, state granted them. But we expect our population growth to be quite large um, mm -hmm. through 2030. Housing costs are going to go up. Um, availability is going to become an issue. Uh, being able to afford to live in Rochester versus an outlying community and what kind of transportation they'll have to get here is an issue. So we're taking steps here already. Yeah. Um, and in our affiliate, we're trying to engage people more in the advocacy. And I'd certainly like to encourage other affiliates to be there at Habitat on the Hill when the time comes, yeah. um, like we did last year. Brian, that is really exciting to hear. I love hammer with a heart. I think that is a brilliant catchphrase or, or um, statement there. And it's exciting to hear the work you guys are already doing there. So thank you. I have a lot of okay. other comments and, and great things from other folks too. Um, Brian, you can go ahead and mute yourself or I can do that for you. you just click on that phone thing and then you can do it yourself later. Um, so Tristan in Douglas County, which is um, Alexandria in that area, but um, so they're going to the Build Think Act training that we mentioned in November. Um, and she says to hopefully implement the program there. Um, and she just led a fall break trip for a bunch of college students and did a lot of advocacy stuff with them. So they're fired up to keep working on it at Gustavus. Um, Parker from Goodhue County, uh, Red Wing area, um, says that they don't have 
uh, specific plans other than to continue telling their story through digital media. And I know, Parker, your um, VISTA last year had an award for the ABWK program with John Klein, which that she received from John Klein. So I think that was um, that was a great way of just telling your story and leveraging those relationships. Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, and Britta had shared some comments then too. And Britta is up in North St. Louis County, Hibbing, Virginia area. Um, she said, uh, no one has voiced anything to her at this point about 2014 advocacy, but um, as a communications VISTA, she thought she would add it into her communications audit. Um, and she has a lot of um, relationships with some um, different politicians or legislators. Um, so wanting to do that and thinks it would be great to have them involved. She also mentioned that Senator David, oh yeah, and I should know this, shouldn't I? But David Tomasoni, am I saying that correctly? Has been a huge support to them and even attended their most recent groundbreaking in Hibbing. Great. So yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of really exciting work going on. And I got his name and... right, she told me. Thank you, Britta. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so this is all really exciting and I want to take a moment to share with you about the campaign that we've put together here at Twin Cities Habitat. Um, I want to make it very clear that we are completely open for sharing, steal away, whatever. If if um, I know not every affiliate has the capacity to have basically a full-time advocacy person and so I want to make it clear that you know I'm here if anybody needs me um, so let's see okay so we have a campaign of five steps for affordable housing and the real goal is to try to really be um, diligent about growing we have so many volunteers that work with us here in the Twin Cities that we really need more people involved so we've kind of ranked people from one through five and how engaged they are and we really want to grow the number of people that are at one at number one and two and we want to be really smart about offering additional opportunities for people to get more engaged as fours and fives and so this is a campaign around really growing those uh, the base if you will um, and I want to be very clear with people up front about what I'm asking for them so that they know what I'm asking of them so then they're not afraid and um, and so that they're hopefully excited about it. So the first thing we did is we uh, utilized the petition. Um, the petition is the one that came out by HFHI around World Habitat Day and we tweaked it to our own um, for Twin Cities and kind of changed a little bit. This is the petition and we're asking as many supporters as possible to sign it and as you can see it's a more general petition. It doesn't have a specific call to action. It's just really more support around it. We would like this petition to be delivered around Thanksgiving to legislators at the Capitol. Um, maybe around Christmas. We're trying to grow that list as quickly as possible. The second part is a traveling photo booth with postcard. And so what this looks like is I will, we literally are going to have a, you know, a printer, a phone, and then a bunch of supplies that can go to work sites. It can go to, you know, we have a young professionals network and sometimes they have happy hour. It can go to any fundraising event. It can go um, basically anywhere. And it's uh, people will be able to take a picture holding a whiteboard saying what they love about Habitat or why they support um, funding for affordable homes, um, maybe a statistic or a story that's really stuck out to them. They'll be able to take their picture right there and it's going to go right on the postcard um, for a legislator. And the postcard will be shaped as maybe a toolbox or maybe um, a, a paintbrush other such tools that make it very obvious that it's habitat and on there it will very clearly say I support a hundred million for affordable housing or affordable homes with the picture right there and everyone will have an opportunity to sign um, and write their own message right there to their legislator. The third thing is we'd like to engage youth um, in some capacity. In the past the youth have put together some little houses, um, um, made some, I think they've colored some pictures, there's potential as we're about to go into our new building to do a bigger project at our 
uh, grand opening there with um, a bunch of families to have something to take to the Capitol, um, perhaps in March, um, so that we are, are constantly being present at the Capitol there. The fourth is a monthly email. It just goes out once a month and it has news, maybe some articles that have come out, and a, a call to action inviting people to contact their legislators through our online system. It's super easy. You put your name and your zip code and it goes automatically. It doesn't, it's not a lot of work. Um, and so it's really easy for people to get involved that way. And then last, we really just are excited to have a big presence at the Capitol this year. Homes for All is um, putting together an entire campaign of lobby days. So it'll be several lobby days. It's like five to eight lobby days. Um, and Habitat's lobby day will probably be in April. So we're going to be able to have constant presence at the Capitol to be talking with legislators about, about affordable homes and um, housing affordability. So this is the five steps to funding for affordable homes for the one and twos. There's also going to be additional opportunities for people who want to be highly engaged to get more involved. For instance, they could come and deliver the petition or the postcards with me um, directly to their legislator. Um, um, they could themselves sponsor a traveling photo booth party or event, whatever they want to do. So there'll be more opportunities to get involved and also um, the main focus this year is getting the bonding bill passed, but there may be some other legislative issues that we work on, and we'd like to get those fours and fives involved in those other issues, and I'll talk about those in a minute. So whatever anyone does, if it's kind of piggyback off of this campaign or do their own campaign, do different things, just really want everyone to get involved, and this is the biggest thing that I like to tell people about advocacy. It's really easy. You know why you love Habitat. Tell your story. Your actions matter. And I used to work for, before this job, I used to work for a congressman, so I can honestly say that it makes a huge difference when people do um, communicate with their legislators directly. Um, and for those of you that are in outstate Minnesota, you are... Rebecca, we had a question about um, yeah. the traveling photo booth. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> um, Britta asked if it's something uh, we put together ourselves, or do you as gals have this for us? And um, thinks it would be great to do at their annual dinner in February. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a really good question. Um, so the goal will be to have it all ready to go um, with uh, the post. We're meeting with the, the graphic designer to design the postcards, and um, the photo booth will be as simple as a printer and you know my cell phone. It, it can be that simple, and it's something that I could absolutely help you set up or adapt. Obviously, you know, you probably would want some props like um, a construction hat or some tools and stuff that people could also use. Uh, really make it fun and engaging and really be able to talk to people about advocacy in a photo booth type situation. So if um, you didn't have the, you know, we could provide the postcards, we could potentially provide the photo booth itself, or it could, it could be um, so it could be as simple or as elaborate as we want it to be. So it's basically. not like this actual little house that's on uh, this picture? We'd love to use this house in some situations, <laughs> and we might. Okay. Like, for instance, um, um, our grand opening of our new location, we probably will use this house. But it, as you can tell, it's rather large, so it won't be... Um, something that could be easily taken to, for instance, a site mm -hmm. um, and set up there for lunchtime to ask people to do this. Sure. So um, it really can vary um, to what anyone's needs are and what, uh, what their capacity is. Okay. And I'm happy to help get that set up. Cool. We should bring it to the Oli conference. That actual yeah, little it, house would be kind of good. Then people could take all kinds of pictures from each of their exactly. service areas. Exactly. Fun. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and that really is the goal at the end of the day, is we want to make ad advocacy to a lot of people is very scary, um, talking about money can be scary. We really want to make it easy, accessible, fun. We want people to understand what it, what the ask is and why it's so important. And this is just like a really fun way to engage people. So um, I just wanted to reiterate that people in outstate Minnesota, uh, that um, that you guys in particular are part are are uniquely powerful, that I can load a bus full of 30 um, people from South Minneapolis and drive to the Capitol with them, and you can show up with with yourself and another person, and that's actually way more powerful um, because you took the time to 
down to the capital and uh, you I mean I just can't really stress how how important that is if you're able to do it um, how how powerful you are um, you're also part of something big and powerful the entire homes for all coalition you know you already might be involved with some other organizations that are part of homes for all um, and that are doing some phenomenal work. Um, the Coalition for the Homeless, the Homeless does some great work in Duluth and Rochester. Um, Rebecca, so, Brian wanted yep. to say something about being from Greater Minnesota, being outstate and going to the Capitol. Yeah, of course. Yes, I'd like to speak briefly to that. Um, when I signed up for the immersion retreat, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Jill had responded, oh boy, someone from outstate, not from the Twin Cities. So I got the impression that not only that, but even um, advocating on the Capitol Day, I don't know if there were others from out state very much or very many, but I got the sense that that doesn't happen a lot. Um, mm -hmm. That a lot of times it's folks from the Twin Cities area. And Correct. it seemed to me that if we could get at least one person, and I can't see why we couldn't get at least one person from every affiliate in the state to go to the Capitol, how much more powerful that would be. That is, that's so true, Brian. Not just thinking, well, it's those Twin Cities folks again. It, no, it's everybody in Minnesota. Correct. And it is the, 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 most of the legislators within the Twin Cities will support uh, funding for affordable housing. Where we really struggle is with some of the legislators um, throughout the state, and so that's why it's so important. And we are going to have a lobby day in April, which everyone's welcome to, but if that's not convenient for people to get to, I can make something else work. I'm happy to be available, whatever works for any affiliate. And not and that you can read their minds, Rebecca, or that you should know everything there is to know about it in the, your first 90 days, but why would that be? Why would it be harder to get the support of greater Minnesota legislators for affordable housing issues? I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about the need for affordable housing throughout Minnesota. Um, I think that a lot of legislators think it's it's a, a city issue and they don't feel like they should have to invest or put some uh, money into that. Mm -hmm. um, that's simply not true. Um, and you guys know that best. I think the other thing is that bonding is something that um, some legislators are just opposed to because they feel like borrowing money is always bad. And it, and it does take some education around borrowing money for the right good. There is such a thing as good debt and we need to um, make sure that we are taking advantage of incredibly low interest rates. Um, failure to do so will actually just exasperate the problem as homelessness rates continue to grow as affordable housing gets tighter and tighter and tighter throughout the entire um, state. And and so I think I think most people understand it once they learn more. They just don't they don't some people truly don't believe that housing is an issue outside of the cities. So what if an affiliate this is not a question that I gave to you ahead of time, so sorry if I put you on the spot. That's okay. What if an affiliate, I just thought of it, what if an affiliate, you know, leader, executive director, board members, board president, what if they also feel like bonding is a bad idea? Um, what would be your advice for them in, in the advocacy? I mean, I, my thought is that they could still tell the story of Habitat and they don't have to mm -hmm. be rah-rah for the bonding bill. Uh, two things. Um, one, um, Homes for All will do a bonding training that will get down into the nitty gritty of what bonding is, why it's important, how it works, um, that really might help people understand it a whole lot better. Um, so if they have questions on that, I can try to answer them. We're also going to try really hard to make that uh, uh, be broadcast over the internet or over the phone or something so that anyone can participate wherever they are and I can let people know when that is. We'd love to have you um, join in on that if you feel like you want to be a bonding nerd like I do. Um, and and the second thing is um, because the continuum of housing is so important, um, um, we are we will have a budget next year that will benefit Habitat and so yes, telling the Habitat story is very important, tell, telling why you think affordable housing is very important. I will say, however, the ask for $100 million for affordable housing is important. That ask is important. Um, being specific is important. But if that's something that people can't feel like they can't do, um, that's okay. Um, we can figure out a strategy or a campaign that might feel more comfortable to them. Great, thanks. Yeah. 
Um, I, I have no idea if that's the case in any affiliate, but just if there are legislators who are feeling that way, my guess is that then in that those parts of the state then too, and, and, and all over that there probably are, their constituents feel that way as well. Yeah, and that's actually a really good transition into getting feedback about the legislative agenda that is being considered for Homes for All. So we've talked about bonding, and that is very clearly the campaign that Homes for All is going after. And we're really excited and hopeful about that. To give you a tinge more background, we asked for $50 million in bonding last year. Um, and there was a bonding bill last year that was about, I think it was $850 million, um, but it was not able to get passed in its entirety. It was really shrunk down, and basically all of it went to funding um, repairs to the capital. And so we have our $50 million ask wow. out there from last year that did not get passed. Um, and, the peop and, and so that's another reason why the 100000 is on the table this year and with a 10% of the bonding bill, kind of what we really want to be stressing. But we have some other legislation that we're considering, and anyone who has any feedback on these, I'd really love to have it. So the first is policy. So there are three policy things that we're looking at. Expungement of an un unlawful detainer from a person's rental history at some point. Um, if you don't know, an unlawful detainer is an eviction action. An eviction is staying on people's records now permanently. They used to kind of go away after a few years because records went away, but with the internet and um, technology the way it is, um, people are being denied from housing because 10 years ago, 12 years ago, they were evicted from their home for some reason. And so that is looking at how we can get those um, um, evictions cleared from people's rental history. So if you have any thoughts on how that might impact you where you are or if you think that's good or bad policy, I'd love to hear it. The second is ban the box for housing applications. Ban the box um, passed last year um, for employment purposes. Um, ban the box means that you're not allowed to ask for uh, people's criminal history background at the time of initial application for employment. Um, that is not that you can't discriminate against people for um, having um, a criminal background, but it just can't be your initial reason to exclude somebody for a job um, in, the, in, in Minnesota. And the reason for that is because it was having a hugely dispro disproportional impact against people of color, and it wasn't giving people a second chance to kind of prove themselves. Uh, maybe once you get to know them, you find out that you can ask them questions about it or learn more about them. Um, and there's some thought about putting that ban the box policy towards housing applications um, between you and me. I don't know that that is a good idea. Um, I think that, for instance, it could violate HUD provisions that require background checks. And um, I also don't know that it's something that a lot of people would feel particularly comfortable with arguing the totality of, of, of what that could mean in terms of um, never being able to ask, for instance, if you um, have a record of child, child sexual abuse. Um, I would always argue that everyone deserves housing, but it just makes it a more difficult um, argument to make. And the third um, policy change is uh, changing the Minnesota Human Rights Act to include Section 8 vouchers and public assistance. Um, Section 8 came out right after the Minnesota Human Rights Act did, so right now landlords can discriminate against people who have a Section 8 voucher. It's not a protected class. And that's having a huge impact because there are fewer vouchers and with the cost of rents going up, um, it's easier for, or it's much more difficult for Section 8 holders of vouchers to find housing. Um, again, between you and me, I have some concerns about unintended consequences, how that might just end up in re um, rents being raised outside to price anyone out of Section 8 vouchers, and also that uh, Section 8 is a voluntary program by landlords, and so making it a protected class would make it involuntary, and I wonder if we're trying to make it involuntary, if this is the right way to do it. Um, but those are kind of some of them. Does anyone have any thoughts on these? I don't see anything yet. If somebody, if something pops up though, I'll just, I'll jump in and I'll let you know. Okay. The other thing that, um, and some of these are really, I don't know, I spend a lot of time thinking and researching this. So if you have some thoughts later on, feel free to get in touch with me. Mm -hmm. um, this is also potentially an appropriations year. Um, 
if it's a supplemental budget is proposed, um, Homes for All is considering asking for 18 million for the service side of things. So long-term homelessness support, emergency shelter programs, Homeless Youth Act. And where this 18 million comes from is last year we asked for 50 million. Um, part of that was for infrastructure, such as Habitat, and part of that was for services. We, we know that we can't have, um, we, we need to have the pairing of housing with services. Um, and so in order to continue communicating this mes message, if a supplemental budget is proposed, we are considering asking for the 18 million that was excluded from last year that we were not successful at getting last year. Um, I don't, I do believe that it will be a mini appropriations year. Um, however, there's some things that perhaps are higher on the agenda. One of those is the warehouse tax that has a lot of support to change. The school shift has 270 million left and people are really excited about paying that off. And uh, the transportation bill I think is going to have huge priority. They only got a lights on bill last year and so they need, they need to keep their lights on plus. Um, and so I'm not sure if there will be an opportunity for appropriations and there's some back and forth about whether or not it would be politically a good decision to ask for appropriations this year and if so for how much. Um, and so these are these are some of the things that are being considered and I'm interested to know what you think about these and also if you have any other uh, legislative issues that you think are really important that Homes for All um, could take up or that you might be taking up that, that I should know about because maybe um, Twin Cities would love to take it up too. Um, if you have anything let me know. I'm just pausing a moment to see if anybody raises a hand or unmutes or types something in for the other or if they have any comments there. You know, part of what we're trying to learn too is just how savvy <laughs> legislatively or advocacy wise our affiliates are because I think there's quite a range of, of folks who might be really involved locally and we haven't necessarily kept track of that here at the state level. And so yeah. trying to be yeah. a little more aligned and strategic that way. But um, and just, and I feel just like having me on staff helps us be able to do that. But yeah. Right. And I feel like I'm being a bit um, duplicitous because on one hand I'm, I'm saying you actually don't really need to know a lot about policy, about bonding. You just need to be able to tell your story about Habitat, why you love uh, why you love it, why you support housing that's affordable, um, and at the same time I'm talking to you about some pretty detailed and complicated policy stuff, and so I really want the takeaway to be like, this is easy, this is simple, anyone can do it, I'm here to help, um, but for, for those who want the additional information or do have that extra capacity um, to do to do some thinking around these appropriations and policies and stuff, um, I also wanted to provide that as well, but please let the key takeaway be, 100 million in support of affordable homes, and that's what's happening at the state level. And we'd love your, I'd love your support on that. And I think the last slide is just a thank you and my contact information. Yeah, and we have some, we do have some comments and questions. Um, oh, good. And so, I, I mean, so looking at the list of, of folks who are participating today, we do have four vistas with us today okay. and so that okay. always becomes a question then about I mean I look at it and I think you know we have vistas who are working on communication so when we think about just telling your story I mean that all of these things like fundraising advocacy and your communications or public relations all start to overlap and and um for uh Rebecca we're looking at your email now no, I know you are. Um, I'm looking for the new rules that came out on. Oh, uh, um, okay. Because gotcha. they're stricter. <laughs> I just and wanted to make sure. Don't worry, nothing is. I'm trying to you pull know, them up for you guys. So those communications pieces, I mean, we have a restore Vista on here, but you think about how all of your work starts to be impacted by the kind of funding that you get or, and then in having a family services Vista on here then too, to think about you know, when you start looking at family services and taking those applications, sometimes you have to say no and thinking I'll probably very aware of that continuum of housing, even more so yeah. if you're if you're looking at family services. But um, so just to see, Rebecca, if you and as a, you're a VISTA supervisor yourself, but um, yeah. how VISTAs are allowed to participate in advocacy things or um, sometimes yeah. it can be a little vague, but 
That's a good question, and I, I think what I want to stress um, for everyone is that the rules have changed since last year, um, and it's gotten much more strict. And so um, AmeriCorps people simply cannot directly or indirectly recruit people to be talking about policy and to talk to legislators. I believe last year the word indirectly was not included and there was another phrase that also made it a little bit more casual where it, it could be referenced and so it is true that it does take um, uh, kind of somebody else to t step in to do those but what is incredibly helpful uh, amongst the AmeriCorps members that we have here at Twin Cities is um, they are so aware of opportunities that I'm simply not aware of that they can tell me about. So for instance, our uh, person, AmeriCorps uh, person who works with the youth um, is able to tell me about events that I can go to and I can do the advocacy work for. Um, she can't do it, but I can be there to do it. And I would have never have known about it had she not um, um, let me know about it. And so even though any VISTA cannot specifically talk about bonding or encourage people to talk to their legislators or ask for that, um, um, they can let, let, they're probably on the ground more aware of opportunities to do so and might think of creative solution or uh, opportunities to do so. And uh, don't, they don't need to be shy about um, voicing the, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about it more with VISTAs though too. I just thought it was worth yeah. mentioning we can get into the more of the specifics with our vistas but um uh, so then there's also a question just i think maybe tapping just your expertise as um, a lobbyist or as a persuader of <laughs> political types um one of our participants has said that um, they have a hard time with some of their city council members. So I imagine there is mm -hmm. a lot of um, relationship building and things that happen at the affiliate level um, yeah. or at the city and county level, but um, any tips on how to advocate to them? Yeah, so I think that um, anyone who's wanting to do advocacy should take a step back and say, where can they put in time and energy? Because yes, you can get sucked into international, federal, state, <laughs> and then city, and um, and you know, it, it, it to kind of really focus on where your campaign wants to be um, focused on, and then to that end, you can develop a campaign that looks similar to what you're already doing. Um, or, you know, the traveling photo booth, for instance, could easily be adjusted to uh, the local city level um, as well. Um, and, you know, the best thing for city council members is to get them out to sites, to get them um, working on homes. Um, to People love home ownership. People love habitat. This is something that's easy for legislators. Habitat is in a really unique situation compared to, for instance, the Coalition for the Homeless because people aren't as, people are excited about home ownership. People are excited about sweat equity. People are excited that people pay mortgages. Um, and so we've just got a really great story to tell and getting people on site to meet with the families and to work on a home can be really important. Then, of course, you can engage with volunteers on, you know, with a petition or um, with postcards or phone calls, um, similar to what we've discussed already. Does that answer the question, Nicole? Yeah. Um, do you have that one slide that says, can my affiliate legally get involved in lobbying? And it has a series of, of questions. I thought yep. that might be worth just taking a peek at before we end. Sure. This is from um, Habitat International, and the question originally was, is lobbying legal? And this is a very wordy slide, so I apologize. Yes, lobbying by charitable nonprofits. So here's information about um, how it works. And it can, I almost am loath to show you guys this because it can be very stressful. The important thing is, yes, lobbying by charitable yeah, nonprofits. Yeah, I don't want to go into the details legal. on each slide, yes. but yeah, it's just <laughs> um, in general. And because they can go to www.advocatewithhabitat.org right there and check out. Correct. Support. And there's actually that both April, myself, and people at HFHI can kind of help navigate any of these big things like this. But this is really like if you're doing a ton of work, um, like for me, and there's, there's somebody who's on staff to do lobbying. And I don't think that's the situation of most of the affiliates. Yeah. So but this I thought was um, kind of interesting to look at some of these questions, but yeah. 
Yeah. Um, these slides will be included as the slideshow from today. So um, that all that information from HFHI will be there for everyone as well. So if they go there, then there are, are there answers to those questions on the. Yep. Okay, got it. Um, Great. Any other questions from our participants? All, we have all the answers are there. Yeah. Okay. Looks like Britta says thanks. All right. If there are no further questions, just know that um, I'll send uh, Rebecca's info along with the slides and a link to the recording um, this afternoon. And you can always just contact me too, and I can connect you as well. And um, again, let us know if you are interested in that Build Think Act Train the Trainer workshop, and we will keep you posted about Habitat on the Hill uh, for 2014. Thank you so and let much, me know, Rebecca. Yeah, and everyone just keep keep me updated on any campaigns you might be doing because there might be opportunities to collaborate or share resources. Um, Homes for All puts out all sorts of phenomenal stuff that I'd love to be able to give to you to make it really easy. So let me know what you're up to. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.